live from Technion webinars with Technion experts. In life, you don't really know what you get, but it's how you react to it. And in many ways, COVID-19 uh, uh, is a bit of climax in my research because just a few months ago, literally, I was touring California for the ATS and I was uh, announcing publicly the work that was relating to ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which seemed to kind of uh, spike a lot of interest because of this concept, which I'll elaborate upon, which is this foam therapy. Little did I know, little did any of us know that uh, within a few months, this would suddenly be at the forefront uh, of our research efforts. And so suddenly we're in February um, and basically the storm hits planet Earth and we were sped up at full speed to try and prove that this will work in humans. And what you need to understand is this is meant to be a rescue therapy for people who are on ventilators. It is not a cure. If our hypothesis uh, turns out to be right, there is a chance that liquid foam therapy could be a game changer in saving the lives of people who are already in the final stages of the ventilator. One of the hallmarks of conditions such as ARDS is, as I mentioned, many of the lung functions do not work. And one of the things that are very important in the lungs, which is the essence of how we're all here, is that our lungs are not dry. There's a little liquid in them that lines it, which is called surfactant. Now, ARDS has a sister syndrome, and it's called IRDS, which is infant respiratory distress syndrome. But the thing is, is that in IRDS, although it's an invasive approach. We have a therapy that works 98 or so percent of the time. And by some magic of biology, which none of us understand, not only does it immediately alleviate this, this uh, burden of trying to breathe with our muscles, it triggers also uh, slowly um, the cells to start making their own. And the hypothesis was that if liquid doesn't disperse inside lungs of adults and it pools basically the surfactant in specific areas, and we do not witness this in a premature because the lungs are so small, but in something like a balloon the size of my chest, then trying to reach all the areas is very complicated. So the idea was to foam surfactant and administer it instead of injecting it through the inside the trachea and the throat in a liquid form. I don't think it's foreseeable to see within less than 10 months, a year. I, I don't think we would get an approval to run anything in, um, adult, in uh, humans, although maybe, and there are some discussions, that it could be used as a compassionate treatment, which is not something very uh, bloomy, but it is potentially something that could be a difference between life and death. All of a sudden, there is this very clear need that what we need is very uh, rapid, diagnostics that could be distributed um, and done everywhere and not necessarily rely on those um, centralized, centralized lab. The standard method in which the uh, detection is done um, today, the labs, you all read about it, I'm sure all, all the time in newspapers, um, is using PCR. It's, uh, it's a marvelous technique that takes the, uh, the virus RNA and creates additional copies, uh, which can then be detected uh, very easily. But the process of you know, taking the sample, uh, preparing the sample, meaning cleaning it up before it can go into that marvelous process of amplification, 
is a multi-step, very tedious uh, uh, process. And so our focus in the, in the lab is really on making the fastest assay uh, possible. Our target is on the five uh, to 10 minute time scale, uh, which is what I think is, is the time scale necessary if you want to you know, bring the economy back to um, something that is semi-normal, meaning um, you go going to a football uh, game, you're going to an important meeting, you get tested, you get the result on the spot. So time scales of uh, hours are irrelevant there. We, we, we want and we can um, get to, to minutes. And so I, I won't you know, bore you with the, with the technical details, but we are, I'll just tell you that we're testing two uh, main approaches for this rapid diagnostics. One is our method for uh, direct detection of the uh, viral RNA. It is the same target that the PCR is currently using, except we don't go through any of the cleanup, um, any of the amplification. We, by focusing, are able to pull out the RNA molecules from the, the sample and detect them um, directly. The other approach we're, we're, test we're trying um, has, has never been tried before. It's a really an, a very new patent, and that is uh, detecting directly uh, the virus itself. So the virus is 100 nanometers in size, which sounds small. It is small, but is much bigger than other molecules, such as um, antibodies that can label it. And we developed a method that um, if you take um, probes, these are your antibodies, that attach themselves to the virus, all you need to do is mix them, throw them into our chip, apply an electric field. The chip is configured in a way that it simply pulls out just things of that size, 100 nanometers, pulls them out while leaving all the rest of the gunk uh, back, in the, back in the reservoir. And so we think that that is potentially uh, the most minimal approach for doing the, the detection. I'll just end with, with saying that I'm, I'm, I'm excited to have the opportunity to try and contribute uh, to this. I'm, I probably you know, won't save the world in, in two weeks. These are not the timescales for, for these events. Um, but it was like an aha moment. You know, it's everything we've worked on so far uh, is, is, is exactly right for tackling this, for tackling this problem.